Okay, now I am recording. So today I have a cluster of blitz problems on, as I was saying, pure limits. So this is the definition of limits, delta epsilon stuff, continuity, which we spoke about, and the three hard theorems, which I proved in the last meeting for calculus, which I failed to record. Those are the intermediate value theorem, the boundedness theorem, and the extreme value theorem. So I have problems on those. Um, questions on this or logistical stuff or big picture thoughts before we jump in? None of those, but you got you have 20 slides of blitz problems that you've assembled in the past few hours because I mentioned that I wasn't feeling too confident. Wait, sorry, you cut out because you mentioned you weren't feeling what? I'm commenting on the fact that you have made 20 slides of problems to do in like however many hours it's been, not over 24 since I mentioned that I'm not feeling confident. Oh yeah, well, I mean, uh, it's I think it's pretty easy to get to get these together. I mean, I just did this today while I was like, uh, like I asked Chikai a question that I was like waiting for him to answer something and I would do a bunch of these. It only takes me like two minutes to write up one of these problems in the solution, so it's not too time intensive. Um, the disadvantage of that is that there might be typos because I went fairly fast. <laughs> but okay, all right. Let's see. All right. So blitz problem one. This is about the three hard theorems. So we will use one of them. And the question is to prove that there exists some real number, some x in the reals, with the property that sine of x is equal to x minus one. And we have not proved this yet. You will prove this on consolidation document two, but you can assume for the sake of this blitz problem that sine is continuous. Okay, so think about this for, you don't have to have the, the answer right away, but the idea of a blitz question is hopefully it suggests the strategy pretty quickly. So when, once you have an idea, you can start brainstorming aloud for me. Well, this seems like a case where we might be able to apply the intermediate value theorem because, well, sine is basically entirely composed of something going between 0, 0, and 1, 1, or 1, 1, and 0, 1. Good. Yeah, I worded that great. Yeah, sine oscillates between minus 1 and 1. Good. So I agree. So the strategy should definitely be to use the intermediate value theorem. So then all we have to figure out is what function are we going to apply the intermediate value theorem to and what are the endpoints, right? Because we're going to want to find some endpoints uh, where, for instance, like the fixed point problem, remember, where you found endpoints so that it was negative on one and positive on the other, and then you knew that it was zero somewhere in between. So do you see what function we could use to apply the intermediate value theorem for in order to make this equation true? I don't believe I understand, understand what is being asked. Okay, so the uh, <clears throat> as you say, the strategy is to apply the intermediate value theorem, which means we need, remember the statement of the intermediate value theorem is that if there is a function on a closed interval a to b, and say for instance, I don't know, if f of a is less than c, or sorry, let's use y for this, is less than y, which is less than f of b, then there exists a c so that f of c equals y, right? This is, this is roughly the statement, I've been sloppy about the conditions, but this is the statement of the intermediate value theorem, right? So I agree that's the right strategy to use to prove this, but the question is what f and what a, b, and y should we use in the in the statement of the intermediate value theorem to help us show this?
I believe that we, well, our function is simply going to be sine and our interval is going to be, um, I think. I guess zero to, um, try to remember, pi. Okay, so if I we think. I think we're on the right track. If you apply the function, uh, if you apply this theorem with the function sine on zero to pi, sine zero is zero, sine pi is also zero, so maybe you meant pi over two. Oh or my god. These. But even, <laughs> even if we picked those numbers correctly, this would just tell us that there's a number in between zero and pi, for instance, some number in here, so that sine of that number equals some output, some fixed number y between, I don't know, zero and one. So it would tell us that sine of x equals some fixed number y. It wouldn't tell us that sine of x is equal to x minus one, because here the right side depends on x, and to apply the theorem, we need this intermediate value not to depend on x. So I'll, I'll give you the trick uh, that we need for this. So remember, for instance, when we were showing fixed points, we used this trick. Remember, last time we wanted to prove there was some, some uh, I don't know, some number. This was the one on the square, remember? We wanted a fixed point where f of c equals c. So we did this trick where we defined a new function g of x equals f of x minus x. So we defined a new function so that when the new function is zero, the equation we want to hold is true. Because if g is zero, then f of x equals x. That's the trick. So here, the trick that we want to, to use is define a new function. Define it's going to be like, our new function is going to be sine of pi x. Uh, I think we want sine of x minus x plus one. All I'm doing right. is moving this to the other side. We're defining a new function so that when the new function equals zero, the equation we want is true, right? So do you see that when g of x equals zero, that this equation is true just by algebra? Yes. Okay. All right, so now we have to pick a and b. So we have to pick uh, two endpoints, one where g is negative and one where g is positive. So now I'll ask you, I think you already had an idea for one of the endpoints or possibly both of them, but what A and B should we pick so that G goes from positive to negative or vice versa? I believe we can use the, and wait, are you asking for the interval? Yeah, yeah, what is the interval or okay. what is A and B? Negative pi over two to pi over two. Good, so let's take A is minus pi over two say b is pi over 2. Let's see, does this work? So when I plug in a, I get sine of minus pi over 2, which is minus 1. So let's see, g of a should be sine of minus pi, pi over 2 is minus 1, minus, minus pi over 2, plus 1, which is pi over 2, right? I think if I did that right didn't get much sleep, so I might make arithmetic errors, but if I plug in g of b, this is sine of pi, okay, so maybe this doesn't quite work, because we want g to change sign, so g is positive here at minus pi over two, but if I plug in g of b, I get, oh wait, maybe this, does this work? One minus pi over two plus one, but this is still positive, because one plus one is two, pi is about 3.1, so this is like 2 minus 1.5. So our b doesn't quite work. We want a choice of b that makes g negative, right? So can you see a different choice for b that would make g of b negative? Perhaps just pi? Let's see, oh, pi, pi, so g of b, 
let's see, sine pi should be zero minus pi plus one. Okay, good. So if b is pi, then g of b is one minus pi, which is certainly negative. Okay. So I think this interval works because we can assume that sine is continuous, so that the words we have to say, the, the incantation uh, to make this argument is that g of x equals sine x minus x plus one is continuous because it's a sum of continuous functions. Therefore, it's continuous on the interval a, b, where a is minus pi over two to pi. At the left end point, g of a is pi over two, which is positive. At the right end point, g of pi is one minus pi, which is negative. And therefore, there must be some number between minus pi over two and pi where g of c equals zero. So this must be true for some c in minus pi over two pi. And that proves the claim, because if there is a number c where g of c is zero, that means sine of c equals c minus one. Box. Okay. Questions on this? It was mostly just picking these endpoints appropriately. I don't have any questions, but I don't feel like I could do this. Okay, let's. Well, I wrote out a clean solution here, so let's see if we can go through one more time and make sure that we could reproduce something like this. So, what was the strategy? If you see a problem like this where you're trying to prove that there exists a number that satisfies some equation. Usually the strategy is to, one, define a new function which is zero when this equation is true. So this is just moving everything to the other side. And then pick two numbers, a and b. So g of a, well, maybe one has to be positive and one has to be negative. So maybe uh, I'll make this one positive and the other one negative, but the order doesn't matter. And then you apply the intermediate value theorem. So this is the usual strategy for this type of problem. Here, in this problem, we, did, well, I called it g, but we did the first step. So to find a function which is zero when the desired equation is true, use continuity, which is one of the assumptions of the intermediate value theorem, pick two endpoints. So here I picked zero because f of zero is one, and pi, three pi over two, which is the same, no, no, three pi over two is three pi over two. So three pi over two gives us minus one, minus three pi over two plus one, so it's negative. So this satisfies the condition that g changes sign between those two numbers. And then you apply the intermediate value theorem, which tells us that since c is between one and minus three pi over two, or sorry, y is between one and minus three pi over two, there must exist some c in the open interval such that f of c equals zero, which is the desired equation. Um, okay, after seeing it again written up, do you feel more or less likely that you could reproduce a solution like this? More. More, okay. That's good, I think. Yeah, there's one of these on consolidation document two, so. Um, okay, do you want to ask more questions about this type of exercise, or should we move on? I say move on. Okie dokie. Two. Ah, okay, so this is actually directly a consolidation document two problem, so you will write up a solution for this, but first let's do it uh, with pen. So, I mean, we could, we could, now since we've proven polynomials are continuous, we could just answer this in one line and say, because polynomials are continuous and x to the fourth is a polynomial, its limit exists and it equals the function value and we're done. But this problem asks us to prove directly from the definition that this is true. So I'll ask you what, what is, we can do an exploration first to figure out what delta we should pick, but just to start, what quantity do we need to argue is small to do this proof? I 
Are you simply asking for the by definition answer? Yeah, I mean this. I mean, we're going to we want to prove that this that this boolean evaluates to true, and you're supposed to know what this boolean means. So if we're going to prove that this boolean evaluates to true, that boolean unpacks into a statement with an implication that a certain number is smaller than epsilon. So what is the expression that will have to bound by epsilon to do this proof? The absolute value of x minus a. Uh, no. But that's that's two. No, x minus two. Well, we get that's that's still not wrong. wrong. Wait, what'd you say? I said I'm still wrong. Yeah. So we don't have to bound x minus two. We get to choose how small this is, right? The thing we have to bound is x to the fourth minus sixteen, right? We have to prove that this can be made small by making absolute value of x minus 2 small. So you should remember which is which. This is the thing we have to prove. Absolute value of x minus 2 is the thing we get to control. Right. So we must bound absolute value of x to the fourth minus 16. Sorry, what are you saying? So all, sorry. All this time I've been starting my proofs by, I always thought it was the other way around until I saw Spivik lead with the um, implies. Ah, yeah, I mean, the, the statement is that, well, for every epsilon, there exists a delta such that absolute value of x minus a with a zero is less than delta implies absolute value f of x minus l is less than epsilon. So to do, I mean, you have to know what all of these words mean, right? So for every epsilon, there exists a delta. That's why we begin a proof by saying, let epsilon greater than zero be given, right? Because we have to prove for every epsilon, there exists a delta. So whenever you're doing a proof that involves for every, you have to describe a way of proving the statement is true regardless of what epsilon is. So we always begin the proof by saying, let epsilon greater than zero be given. And then you have to pick, you have to show that you can pick a delta. And once you've picked that delta, the thing you prove is that if this is true, then this is true. That's the implication. Implication means if this is true, then this is true. So the thing which we are responsible for convincing the reader of is the right side of this, the one with the epsilon, right? That's what you're saying that you meant by, uh, once Spivak wrote out by the, uh, once Spivak emphasized the implication, that made more sense. It just confused me more because I was like, I've been thinking that we are using the former statement to prove the latter. I oh, you're you're saying we use this to prove this? Uh, I've always thought that's how it's been. Well, that is true. Yeah, we we use this to prove this, but you, it, we should be clear that this thing is something which we get to choose delta, right? So we're trying to pick a delta, then show that this implication is true. So you do prove that the right-hand side is true. This is the thing that we're responsible for showing. But you get to pick delta with the property that this implication is true, right? So. I mean, the, the, this is what, to, to prove that an implication holds, you assume the left side is true and prove the right side is true. But because there's a there exists wrapping this whole thing, that means we get to pick delta and then prove the implication. Okay. So is it clear that to prove that this limit exists, we're going to need to figure out how to make this thing less than epsilon, because that's what appears in the implication. I I thought I was understanding that since we have the ability to choose epsilon. No, we do not. We never choose epsilon. That that never that doesn't make sense from an English standpoint because it's that it looks like it for every epsilon there exists a delta. Yeah, so we have to prove given any epsilon for every number epsilon which we do not pick this is like a function 
This is a function, a Python function, which takes in an input epsilon, which someone else hands you. Someone else hands you that epsilon. You have to write a function which will take any epsilon whatsoever. You have no idea what it's going to be. Your function has to work for any epsilon. But you take in that epsilon and then cook up a delta that makes this true. So you don't get to pick it. The user picks epsilon, right? The user hands your function epsilon. So you don't get to pick what it is. It has to work for every epsilon. That's, that's what for every means, or for all. So in effect, we are proving that there is always an epsilon, excuse me, there is always a delta that exists. Yeah, so that we're proving that for any input epsilon, there exists an appropriate delta such that this implication holds. So you have to show how to pick the delta. Your function has to produce an appropriate delta given any input epsilon. That's the crux of the definition. OK. Good. Is this, I mean, this has to be like, to, like I, this has to be to the point that I could wake you up in the middle of the night, just come shake you awake and ask you to explain a step of this definition. And it has to be so intuitive that it would just roll off of your tongue without thinking. So if there are more questions about this definition, we should spend some time on that because this, this is the, the core of everything moving forward. I don't know what questions to ask. OK. Uh, well, let's, let's try to solve the problem. Let's try to solve this splits problem and see if more questions come up because there will be other other limit type questions. Um, OK, so in the exploration, we're thinking forward to the proof. And we know that we have to show that if anyone hands us an epsilon, we have to be able to find a delta, which is going to make this thing less than epsilon. So in particular, we're planning ahead to figure out how can we choose delta so that this thing will be less than epsilon, where epsilon is, is something handed to us, where that's what we mean by given. Epsilon is given. Someone has given it to us, and we did not get to pick it. Uh, OK, so we've seen several problems of this type. So how do we usually address, or how do we uh, manipulate this expression algebraically when you're trying to bound an absolute value of some polynomial difference like this? Before we have, sim not simplified, I believe factored the x x to the power of 4 minus 16. Good. So x to the 4 minus 16 is x squared minus 4 times x squared plus 4. And I'll go ahead and pull out the, f the piece that we control. So. So this is this is the key. Whenever we were doing an exploration for a limit problem like this, you're, you're trying to massage the thing which we have to prove is small. You're trying to massage that to make it clear how it depends on the quantity that we get to pick, right? Because we get to pick the absolute value of x minus a to be less than delta. So we do the factoring to massage this expression to make it clear how it depends on the thing we control. So this we can make as small as we want, less than delta. Usually when you do these proofs, there will be extra junk that you don't control, right? So we don't control this, but by now you know the song and dance. We usually first make a restriction on delta that allows us to get a bound on this stuff, right? So what do you have a suggestion for what initial restriction on delta, which will restrict our range of x's? What initial restriction should we impose? Could we simply start by saying that absolute, the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than 1? Yeah. So in particular, we're going to, since absolute value of x minus 2 is the thing bounded by delta, we're going to make an initial restriction. Delta must be at most 1. So absolute value of x minus 2, say, is less than strictly 1. So if that's true, the largest x can be, just switching this to the chain of inequalities, the largest x could be is 3. OK, now it's just a question of arithmetic. So it's no longer true that we don't control this. Now we do control this. 
if the biggest x can be is 3, what is the biggest that this product of unsightly terms could be? The absolute value of 5, well, I don't know how to word this quite right. And what is the absolute value of 5 right step? Yeah, so the this factor is upper bounded by absolute value of 5. How is this factor bounded? And it, the absolute value of x, so x to the power of 2 plus 4 is less than 13. Yeah, because the biggest this could be is 3 squared is 9 plus 4 is 13. So overall, this product of factors is upper bounded by 5 times 13, which I believe is 65, right? 50 plus 15, yeah. Okay, so now we know what delta to pick, because we're trying to pick delta so that this whole thing will be less than epsilon. So now we see exactly what we need. So we need delta should be certainly, I mean, we also need this this other condition, but we want delta to be less than epsilon over 65. Because if this is true, and also this is true, these are the two conditions. If these two things are true, the first condition guarantees that this product will be upper bounded by 65. The second condition guarantees that this will be upper bounded by epsilon divided by 65, which means the product of this with the thing bounded by 65 will be less than epsilon. And that's what we're trying to prove. If you prove that given any epsilon, choosing that value, that uh, the minimum, I guess, of these two for delta will bound this thing by epsilon, then you've proven the limit exists. Okay, so I've written I this. Don't, sorry. sorry. Go on. I don't totally understand why that x minus 2 is less than 8 doesn't come into play and, sl and slash 1 multiply by the 65. Why was, you're saying that why this factor of 65 doesn't enter uh, where? So the 65 appears in the choice of delta we made, but you're saying it should appear somewhere else? No. Um, why is our initial restriction? Wait, no. Restriction. Sorry, I should have written this. Why, why isn't 65 being multiplied by 3 as well? Why is it? Uh, where's the, where the 3 coming from? Oh, this 3, you're saying? Yeah. This 3 was just used to bound these terms, right? Uh, or sorry, these factors. Terms are added. Uh, the upper bound of 3 for x was only used to bound these factors. So we don't... There, there's no overall factor of x somewhere. If this were multiplied by x, you would have said, oh, x, x is at most 3. So then you would have said this whole thing is multiplied by 3. But there's no extra factor of the 3. We just use the 3 to bound each of these things. Okay, now I think I see it. Because, um, I don't even know. Because x the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than 1 is what we originally said. Yeah, because remember, we're bounding the absolute value of x minus 2 to be less than delta. So the reason we were allowed to make this original restriction, this one here, that absolute value of x minus 2 is less than 1, the reason we were allowed to say that is because that's the thing we get to make less than delta. So if we first say, well, we're going to pick some delta at the end of the day, and we can make it as small as we like, so we might as well start by assuming it's smaller than 1. And if it's smaller than 1, that gives us the initial restriction. So that's the first step. Then you say, using that initial restriction, now we need to make this thing less than epsilon. So we're going to further restrict the absolute value of x minus 2 so it's smaller than epsilon over 65, because that thing makes this product smaller than epsilon. So we've made two separate restrictions on delta. First, that it's at most 1. Second, that it's at most epsilon over 65, which means we should take the minimum at the end of the day of those two. Good. Now that I've gotten over that part, where? Where's what? Never mind, I don't even know what. I was about to ask where the minimum come from, but I've seen this so many times. 
I don't even know why I asked that. I understand that part fine. Okay, good. Yeah, we just want the smaller of the two. Um, good. Other questions on this argument? Is it at this point proven? Uh, we still have to write out the argument cleanly because this was just kind of the exploration yeah. to find what delta is. But it, once we write it out, well, I'll show the, the argument on the next step, uh, on the next slide, actually. I'll just, this is just the cleaned up version. Holy hell, there's a lot of typos. Okay. What What is SO here? And I wrote 55 instead of 65. Okay. I apologize for this. this nice. Oh, man. Um, okay, so this should be the lowercase so. Let me just x minus 3, so let me just correct some typos here. 65, 65, and 65. Okay, but yes, your question is, is it proven? Yeah, because the, the reason it's proven is that we've shown that the definition of the limit is satisfied which is that given any epsilon, so if you let epsilon be given, choosing this delta, the smaller of one and epsilon over 65, as we've shown by algebra, then guarantees that whenever x sits in the interval of, you know, within distance delta of two, but not equal to two, then the function x raised to the power four will be within distance epsilon of 16. Once you've proven that, then that establishes the limit exists. Ah. I think I'm well. I think I understand this one well enough. Good. Well, I'm glad because there's a lot of typos. Because these should also be fours. <laughs> Man, this is just means I should proofread better. Okay. To. Uh, to hide my shame, I will just advance to the next one right away. Okay, another question. So this will will further make sure you understand the limiting definition. So now we get to assume that we know this limit exists. So assume we already know that the limit as x goes to zero of f of x equals some number l. So this is true. This is given. We can use this. Assuming that's true, now we need to prove that the limit as x goes to zero of f of x cubed is also equal to l. So we'll have to use an epsilon delta definition style argument to show that this thing is true. This Boolean evaluates the truth. Okay, so again I'll start by let's just think about it a little bit. So all right, so what is the quantity that we will need to make smaller than epsilon. So we'll need to, we, I'll just make it a little more explicit. We will need to pick delta so that what? what? What is the implication which must be true for this limit to exist? The absolute value of x minus, excuse me, the absolute value of x to the power of 3 is less than Epsilon? X cubed. Whoa, wait, wait, uh, wait, so we want to pick delta so that when absolute value of x is less than delta, so this is saying x is within dis distance delta of 0, that the absolute value of f of x cubed minus l is less than epsilon, right? I don't know if this is what you meant to say, but. We're trying to prove that we'll, this will be within distance epsilon of this thing. For whatever reason, I thought that we were modifying f of so that was. Okay, well. Like I thought f of x became f of x equals x to the power of 3 or something. Uh, maybe it's easier. Okay, so. I understand it. It's just that I goofed. Well, I think it's also easier just to avoid notational conflicts to define a new function. So instead of calling it f of x cubed, since this is kind of overloaded notation, I'll just define g of x is f of x cubed. I think this, I mean, 
this reduces the strain on my brain at least. So we're trying to prove that now g of x minus l is less than epsilon. Good. This is this is what we have to pick. What we're allowed to use in making that choice is that this limit already exists. So we already know that given I'm going to use this maybe I should I'll just use primes to make it clear that these are dummy variables so I'm not talking about the same delta and epsilon because now I'm stating the definition of this first limit which we know exists so I'm just going to put primes to keep them separate so we already know that if you hand me any epsilon prime greater than zero there is a delta prime so that if the absolute value of x lies within zero and delta prime then f of x minus l will be less than epsilon prime so we assume this is true and we'd like to use this second line or the second part which we've assumed is true to prove the first part okay so think about that for a moment and see if you have an idea for how we can use this assumption on the bottom two lines to pick a delta appropriately for these top two lines. Could we just use that? We know that x is less than delta prime and apply that to the top? Like, I don't know. Uh, we know that x is less. So we don't, well, we should be clear about what implication means. So when, when I write this, I'm not saying that this is true. It's, it's not universally true that x is less than delta prime. It, this implication is what is true. So we're saying that if you hand me an epsilon prime, I can find a delta prime so that whenever x is within distance delta prime of 0, then f of x is within distance epsilon prime of l. But I think what, you, what you're trying to say is we should use a choice of epsilon prime on the bottom, and that gives us an associated delta prime. We should use that in order to guarantee that the top line is also true. I think that's the suggestion you're making. I have no idea. OK. Uh, well, one thing. Well, all right. Maybe I could I could write out the the steps, but maybe it's cleaner to walk through the solution for uh, so we could see it all at once. But okay, so we're going to need to prove that this limit exists with x cubed inside of f, which is what I've called g. So if we want to prove this limit exists. I have to show you how to find a delta for any given epsilon. So as always we say let epsilon greater than zero be given. And now we're going to use the first assumption, which is I think partly what you were suggesting. We're going to use this first assumption that this limit exists in order to pick a delta that will satisfy the definition of the second limit. That's the idea. So here's the argument. Since we know the f this limit exists, the limit as x goes to zero of f of x equals l, we can find a first delta, which I call delta sub zero. We could find delta zero so that whenever this is true, then f of x minus l is less than epsilon. That was what I wrote in the second line on the previous slide in pen. So we know this is true. So I say pick such a delta zero associated with this epsilon, and then define a new number delta, which is simply the cubed root, the cube root of delta zero. This is the key step, that we use the first limit, which guarantees the existence of this delta zero, and then I say take that delta zero and take its cube root. If you do that, that delta, which is the cube root of delta zero, is supposed to satisfy the definition of the limit for the second equation, the second limit existence. And the reason it satisfies that is because if the absolute value of x is less than this new delta, which is the cube root of the old delta, then necessarily the absolute value of x cubed is less than delta zero. So if the absolute value of x cubed is less than delta zero, 
then just applying this limit statement, you can imagine just replacing an x by x cubes everywhere, for instance. If the absolute value of x cubed is less than delta zero, then it follows that the absolute value of f of x cubed minus l is less than epsilon. So all we've done is assume that this limit exists, used the delta epsilon procedure of that limit existence to pick a delta for a different limit. But I'm sensing a lot of confusion, so you should ask questions on this. questions. Are there no questions because it's too hard to formulate a question? I don't have any questions because the way I'm thinking about asking questions is if it's a step that I don't understand but all the steps are understood because that's how you write a proof. I couldn't replicate it, but I understand the problem fine. Ah, I sometimes use the word uh, locally readable for this. When If you read a proof and it's locally readable, you mean at, at each step I understand what's being said in that sentence locally in a small area, but globally I, I don't I understand. understand. how it all. I understand how it all builds up, but I couldn't do it myself. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, that's alright. I mean, that just needs more practice. So. As long as as long as you're you're convinced that you understand both locally and globally what's going on in this argument, then I think we just need to see more of them until it gets to the point that you could do them yourself. Yeah. Okay. So you're happy. You you believe this argument. You think this. Uh, you're happy with this. All these steps. Yeah. Good. Onward. Okay. This is a kind of prove or disprove kind of that. So we make two assumptions. So assume that the limit as x goes to a of f of x exists. So this exists and the limit of the product f of x g of x exists. So both of these limits exist. If that's true, so that both the limit as x goes to a of f of x exists and the limit as x goes to a of f times g exists, is it necessarily true that the limit as x goes to a of g of x exists. Think about that for a second. I believe it does. Okay, what is your reasoning for why g should have an existent limit?
don't have any reason beyond intuition. Okay. Uh, well, let's let's think about some examples. So we know we proved that if the limit of the product exists, then it's equal to the product of those two limits, right? So if this thing exists, it's certainly equal to the limit as x goes to a of f times the limit as x goes to a of g. So if the product limit exists, then these two exist. But in this case, we're trying to go backwards. So let's try to think like penetration testers, like we're trying to break this claim. Can we think of any way that we could make this false? So how could we make it so that this limit does not exist, so this is not an existent limit, but the product limit still exists? Well, one way you might try to do that is say, well, we want g not to exist, the limit of g not to exist, so here's g. Let's try to make this limit not exist by giving it some bad behavior, like, I don't know, maybe it, uh, it jumps at zero or something. So again, we're trying to we're trying to pick an example where uh, the limit as x goes to say a equals zero of g of x does not exist. D and e does not exist. We're trying to see if we can break this claim by picking an f so that this limit still does exist. So is there any way to pick a function f so that the product f of x, g of x, still has a nice limit at zero. How might you try to do that if you wanted to pick an f so that the product is very smooth or constant or something? Perhaps you could simply say that f of x equals zero. Yeah, that's that's always a my first go-to for building counterexamples is what happens if one of the things goes to zero. So if f of x equals zero, the product f of x times g of x is certainly zero everywhere, right? So this thing is zero. But this seems like it's broken our claim, right? Because if f of x equals zero, we've proven that a constant function has an existent limit at every point. So if this is true, then it's true that the limit as x goes to zero of f of x equals zero, because it's constant. Uh, f of x times g of x is also constant, so the limit as x goes to a of the product, fg, that's also zero, so that exists. So apparently this limit exists, and this limit exists, but this limit does not exist. So it, apparently this claim is not true, right? So it's not necessarily true that this uh, g, this factor's limit must exist because the product can be smoother. If you multiply by zero, the product function can be smoother and have a limit even though g itself does not have a limit at the point. Good, does, that, does uh, the idea of building that counterexample to break the claim, does that make sense? Yes. Good. Uh, I think I've just written it up more carefully, possibly with more typos on the next slide. So the answer is no. I think this is the same thing I just drew. If f is zero, then the limit is x goes to zero. If f is zero, the product is zero, but this limit does not exist. Okay, so it's the same thing. Uh, questions or thoughts on this sort of argument? I have none. Good, okay. Let's do another. Ah, okay, so here's a fun one. So this is about continuity rather than just limits, uh, but we're still going to have to do some epsilon management, as Terry Tao calls it. So we assume that f is continuous at a, which we remember means that the limit as x approaches a of f of x exists, and it's equal to the function value. So we assume this is true. And we're trying to prove that for any epsilon greater than zero, there's a delta so that when x minus a absolute value is less than delta and y minus a absolute value is less than delta, then absolute value of f of x minus f of y is less than epsilon. So notice this is not the usual definition of a limit because we have two different points. This is a, a new proof. It's a new property. We're proving that if, it's con if f is continuous at a and there's two points x and y, 
that are both within distance delta of a, then the distance between those two outputs must also be upper bounded by whatever epsilon you like. So this is something new we have to prove. So looking at this, is there any strategy or idea that jumps out at you for how we can use continuity to get at a claim like this or to prove that, for instance, this implication must be true? I'm not seeing any way to use continuity directly. I'm just thinking about using what the two what the two inequalities absolute value of x minus a is less than delta implies. So you want to use these two, you're saying? Yeah. But the problem with that I'm seeing is the only way that could really work is if L, in this case, is zero. Right, yeah. So Just I think... if, if it were to be that simple, when it, is, it isn't. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Uh, you're, you're looking for how does L enter into this argument, the value of the actual limit, which is f of a. Let me zoom out a little bit, because this is... Son of a bitch. I want to draw a picture. There we go. Um, yeah, the way to think about this is that you're you're wondering how does L enter, and the answer is basically here is f of a, which is our L value, and we have some some curve. Uh, I didn't draw that very well, but you get the point. So I don't know, say x is here and y is here. So we have two numbers that are both, I mean, I should really say this is x and this is y because they're the inputs. So these are f of x and f of y. Okay, so you're saying how does L enter? How does f of a enter? And the way it's going to enter is that we know that if f of x and f of y are both close to f of a, then they must be close to each other, right? If f of y is within some distance, say, epsilon over 2 of f of a, and so is f of x, then I think we can combine the, the, those two inequalities that we would get from continuity to get something that tells us that those two numbers themselves have to be close to each other. Right? If two numbers are each very close to a third number, they must also be very close to each other. And I'll give you the trick, the trick which is one of those things that makes you feel silly in hindsight once you've seen it, but uh, you know, it's always adding zero. f of x minus f of y is the same as f of x minus f of a minus the quantity f of y minus f of a. I think this is what you were getting at when you were saying it only works if L equals zero. By L, you're, you meant f of a, right? I think that's what you were getting at because you didn't see how the L entered, but we can always add and subtract the L inside, right? That's glorious. <laughs> Love it. Okay, uh, good, so what, well, let's just follow our nose. So if we add and subtract the L, the f of a inside, what do we get by the triangle inequality? That should be thinking, yeah, less than or equal to the absolute value of f of x minus f of a plus the absolute value of f of y minus f of a. Yeah, f of y minus f of a, good. Okay, now how do we argue that these two terms can be made small? How do we bound these guys?
Well, we should be able to say something about each of those because these are the the L values, right? The thing the function is supposed to be getting close to. So we're supposed yeah. to be able to say these are small somehow, right? I'm just seeing that these are what our x minus a is less than delta is implying, but not much else. Yeah, yeah, but that's that's exactly what we need though, right? Because the fact that f is continuous is the statement, or the fact that f is continuous at a is the statement that the limit as x goes to a of f of x equals f of a. So this is saying for every epsilon we can find a delta so that when x is within distance delta of a then f of x minus f of a absolute value is small. So these are exactly the two quantities which we can make small using the continuity argument. So the, the words we have to say, the, the incantation is uh, choose delta greater than zero so that I'm going to use a new dummy variable because x and y are already used so that absolute value of z minus a is less than delta implies now we really should have said let epsilon greater than zero be given so we're trying to make this whole thing less than epsilon so if we already know what epsilon is epsilon greater than zero is given we're going to choose delta so that this implies absolute value of f of z minus f of a is less than epsilon over 2. That's what we want to do. Because if we choose that delta and then impose that x and y are both separately within distance delta of a, then these two terms both look like this. Right? These two terms are both of this form for say z equals x and z equals y. So then you would say this thing has to be less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2, which is what we wanted to bound it by. Okay, I've written out the argument in words again on the next slide since I know it's hard to, to follow a proof when I'm saying words and also drawing sloppily at the same time, but uh, what do you think of the big picture of this argument here? I think I'm understanding it, but not quite seeing how our stuff in green implies that that is true. Okay, yeah, let me, let me clear this and then show how the stuff in green is, is used in the proof. Okay, um, so the stuff in green again was these two pieces, right? The assumptions that x and y are within distance delta of a, is that right? So in the proof, what we said was that if you hand me some epsilon, uh, we use continuity to say that the limit as x goes to a of f of x equals f of a. That means that we can find a delta so that whenever x is within distance delta of a, this is true. That's how we use the green stuff, right? Because if both x and y are within that distance delta of a, then both the f of x minus f of a and the f of y minus f of a are both less than epsilon. So we've used this line twice. Twice. That's, I shouldn't have used x here. This was sloppy to use the, the dummy variable twice. So we've used this assumption twice for once for x and once for y. Okay. Does that answer the question about where these the, the two assumptions up here are used? I believe it does. Good, okay. Um, other thoughts on this question? This is really the only ingredients here were the uh, continuity using the triangle inequality and picking a delta for half epsilon and then stringing those together. Uh, thoughts on this? I have none. Sweet. Do another. Uh, okay, this is kind of fun. This this argument comes up a lot when we introduce integration. We're going to need some variant of this argument uh, many times. So the 
the assumption, the setup, is that suppose f is continuous, so we have some continuous function at a point a, and f of a equals zero. So there's an original function, I'll draw the original function, say in pink, which is zero at a point a. Then we define a new function, which is f plus alpha, and maybe I'll draw that in green. And I mean, we usually think of alpha as small, but just to emphasize uh, in this drawing, I'll make alpha very big. So we define a new function, which is just f shifted up everywhere by alpha, which should look like this. And we need to prove that for some alpha, for you know any alpha not equal to zero, it could be negative as well, that this new function f plus alpha is non-zero in an open interval containing a. So we have to find some interval, say, I don't know, a minus delta to a plus delta, where f is non-zero. Okay, what ideas or thoughts do you have about how we can do that proof? I don't believe I'm totally understanding this statement, but when it says open interval, I'm thinking of the intermediate value theorem again. Uh, okay, so the intermediate value theorem would tell us that there exists a point in an open interval where f takes a certain value. But I don't know if that helps us here, because here we want to show that this function is non-zero in the whole interval. So this is a statement about all of the values of the function on the entire interval, and not the existence of just one particular value uh, in the interval, which is what the intermediate value theorem tells us. So I think we'll have to use the definition of continuity directly, rather than the intermediate value theorem. Maybe just from the picture, how would you, this is the point, plug in A and you get alpha, how would you find an interval around A so that you know that F stays non-zero in that entire interval? So you don't want this function to change by so much that it crosses zero over your interval what would you use to argue you can find a small enough interval so that f plus alpha stays non-zero? I... Oh my god, my dog's going wild. Anyways, I'm going to talk over them. I have no idea how to approach this idea of an interval. Right now I'm just thinking about what the first sentence is implying. Okay, good. What does the first sentence, the continuity at A, what does that imply? So this is basically saying that the limit as f of x, as f of x of f of x as x approaches a equals zero. Good. Okay. So this is zero, and we're interested in this other function, which is just shifting f by a constant. So you can probably just add alpha to both sides since we've proven that the limit of a constant exists. So this is fair game. Right, so f of x plus alpha equals alpha, right? So this is the function we're trying to prove. That's the thing appearing here, f plus alpha. Uh, 
Good, so we know this is true. Now we have to use, I mean, we, what, what implication of this limit existence can we use to find the interval? Or, or, or what does this line imply, I guess? So this is a continuity proof and not a go into epsilon and delta. So oh, anyway. you'll, you'll, just because it, it involves continuity doesn't mean we won't need some epsilon management. I think we will need to pick an epsilon here. So uh, yeah, many, many proofs in, in calculus are going to involve epsilons and deltas, even if it's not explicitly a limit, just because, uh, you know, often often we, we need to pick some small positive number, but yeah, so that's fair game is the answer. So I guess we could start by, as this is implying, writing down that um, deep thinking. Deep. Is it a correct step to just start writing down our what we know just based off the fact that this is a limit in terms of definition. Yeah, it can never hurt to remind yourself. Sure, so what does this mean? Or in other words, what does this unpack into? So this basically, oh, that's interesting. Didn't notice until now that what this implies is that um, the absolute zero is less than the absolute value of f of x plus alpha minus alpha. Uh, yeah, because yeah, yeah. All, all we've done is uh, added alpha okay. going from this line to this line, right? But, well. We should be somewhat more complete. So what this really means is for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists delta greater than zero. So, well, it's continuous at A, so I really don't need the zero at the end, at the, the left side. X minus A is less than delta implies, now I'm, I'm still going to put the f of x plus alpha minus alpha in, even though it's zero. I'm just going to leave that there for the moment. Less than epsilon. Okay. So we would like, so this is true. Uh, we've assumed that this limit exists. Now we're trying to prove that this quantity is non-zero in some open interval. So since this statement holds for every single choice of epsilon, in, in particular it holds when epsilon is half of this constant alpha, right? So this statement is true for every epsilon, therefore it is true for epsilon equal to alpha, which means that there must be some delta, which means that when x is within distance delta of a, then this thing, this difference, is smaller than, say, this alpha. So, uh, try to erase. Maybe I should go to the next. Yeah, I have this written out neatly on the next slide. Yeah, here we go. I should choose alpha over 2 because I want to make sure that f is non-zero on an interval, right? 
because the, the entire purpose of this proof is to show that we can find it an open interval where f plus alpha is non-zero, so you would like uh, you would like to apply the limit definition in a case which guarantees that f doesn't cross zero. So, uh, okay, this is getting very messy. All right, so I'll I'll say the words again and then I'll show the the formal proof. So, this this is what you told me. We we've assumed that this is true. You told me that the the implication of this is that for every epsilon greater than zero, there's a delta. So that when x is within distance delta of a, then f of x plus a alpha minus alpha is less than epsilon. In particular, there exists such a delta when epsilon is say half the absolute value of alpha, so that it doesn't cross the the uh, y-axis, I guess, so that f doesn't hit zero. So if we see... Would you, could you possibly pause for like five seconds? To... Yeah. <laughs> Had to move upstairs because Mason was being absurdly loud in the basement. Was he putting protein powder in Gatorade again? No. And I... Last thing I was really able to pay attention to was like 30 seconds ago. Oh, well, that's upsetting. Uh, okay, maybe I'll just I'll show the neatly written proof and then start the explanation over. Okay. Um, I seriously have no idea how to go about this proof. Okay, well, let me draw the picture again. So we'll rethink about the exploration. So uh, here's the function f plus alpha, right? So here's the function we're interested in. And when you plug in a, you get alpha. So this height is alpha, and this is the point a comma alpha. There we go. What are we trying to prove? We're trying to prove that if f is continuous at a and f of a is zero, then f plus alpha, which is the function I've drawn, f plus alpha, which is also continuous because it's the sum of a continuous function and a constant, we're trying to prove that f plus alpha is non-zero in an open interval containing a. So all we have to do to prove this is to find, maybe I should switch colors, we have to find an interval around A with the property that f plus alpha is non-zero in that interval. Okay, is the goal of what we're trying to do. We're trying to find an interval on which this function does not hit zero, which is true the way I've drawn it. Uh, is the goal clear? Yes. Good. So to do that, we use continuity because continuity tell, tells us that the limit exists at this point, which means that, I mean, roughly speaking, we can constrain this thing to lie within whatever epsilon bars we like, speaking loosely. So if we want this function not to hit zero, so not to cross this axis down here, we simply choose our epsilon bars to be half as big as alpha, because this thing is at height alpha. So if we choose our epsilon bars to be, for instance, alpha over 2, or sorry, absolute value of alpha over 2, because alpha could be negative, if we choose our epsilon bars to be that uh, half that height, then we're guaranteed that the function will not cross the axis, and it will remain non-zero in the interval with the delta associated with that epsilon. That's the idea of the proof. So ask me questions on that. I still have no idea what's going on. Okay, let me let me back up just so... Uh, I want to clarify one thing. So a couple slides ago when we were talking about the delta epsilon definition, um, when I said you never pick epsilon, I should have clarified when you're proving a limit exists, you never pick epsilon. Because the statement that a limit exists, say this thing equals L, if you're proving that this thing exists, then you don't get to pick epsilon. Epsilon is handed to you and you have to cook up a delta appropriately. Right? So in proving a limit exists, you don't get to pick epsilon. Epsilon is something which is handed to you. That's the first kind of limit problem. 
The second kind of limit problem is where you assume a limit exists, so you know that this thing is already true, and you try to use that to prove some property. In the second type of limit problem, you can use any epsilon you'd like, because you are assuming that the definition of the limit is satisfied. So in this problem, which is of the latter type, we assume the limit exists, and we're trying to choose epsilon in order to prove this other property, that f plus alpha is non-zero in an interval containing a. Okay, so that's, that's the strategy for this problem, is to use the limit, the existence of the limit, to prove that f plus alpha is non-zero in, in, in an open interval containing a. Um, okay, is that part, well, Maybe I should just ask you which part uh, is confusing or most confusing on this slide so we can focus on that. Right now I'm just reading through the proof to see if there's anything that has me asking where did that come from. Okay. So is there anything that has you asking, where did that come from? As I'm reading through, um, this x in the open interval a minus delta, a plus delta. This thing here. Yes. Yeah, this is this is the set of all x's that satisfies the left side of this implication. Okay. Have you, at this point, explained it to me three times? What, the this solution three times? Yeah. Uh, I don't think so, unless I've lost count. I mean, we drew it on the previous slide when we were trying to kind of come up with the proof via exploration, and then I guess we read through this once. So, I mean, I don't know what counts as, as a full explanation, but um, I mean, we'll go through as many times as we need. It should make sense. Can I see this reverse triangle inequality? This, yeah, this, uh, it's the statement that absolute value of a, my, well, I shouldn't use a and b because they're, they're used above. Absolute value of say m minus absolute value of n is always less than or equal to the absolute value of m minus n for any m and n. This thing, I think I've applied here with 
Let's see if I get the M and N right. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, see what I'm doing. So I think I have M is G of X and N is alpha. So that means, let's see if I just copied this properly, that absolute value of G of X, which is the M, minus the absolute value of alpha is less than or equal to this, which by the chain is also less than absolute value of alpha over two, less than absolute value alpha over two. Oh, I think I've gone the wrong way. I wanted it the other way, right, okay. So I should have made n g of x and m alpha. So I should have picked this direction because then I would have said absolute value of alpha minus absolute value of g of x is less than the absolute value of alpha over two. Yeah, that's the direction I want because then I add absolute value of g of x to both sides, subtract absolute value alpha over two from both sides, and then that means absolute value of alpha over two is less than absolute value of g of x. Right? That's the one I want because that shows that this thing is non-zero. Is that part okay? Yeah. Okay. I think I actually proved this in a follow-up on one of the Piazza posts. Um, it's, I mean, this is just the usual triangle inequality with, you can prove it in like two lines, uh, just choosing the letters appropriately. But um, I will never forget, I had a, a math lecturer at MIT in a functional analysis class who referred to this uh, as the reverse triangle inequality in the middle of a lecture, and then he paused he said, and by the reverse triangle inequality, stopped, then turned and faced the audience, and then clarified. And he said, by reverse triangle inequality, I, of course, do not mean what you get by taking the ordinary triangle inequality and reversing the sign of the inequality, because that has the distinct disadvantage of being false. <laughs> <laughs> so this is different from what he claims is the 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 other reverse triangle inequality. But okay, uh, all right. Besides that, is the idea here okay, or are there more questions? I believe I understand all the sentences on this slide. Okay, locally readable and kind of how they construct. I think the big picture is similar to the three hard theorem style proofs where we were always separating things by epsilon bars. Here we're just separating f plus alpha from zero by epsilon bars, which are alpha over two. But, all right, but let's, let's look at another one. Uh, how about this? So this is kind of, this is assuming f satisfies half of the two assumptions of linearity from the matrices lectures, right? That it distributes over addition, but not the second one about f of ax. But anyway, so suppose that f satisfies this thing, f of x plus y is f of x plus f of y, and it's continuous at zero. So can we prove that f is continuous at a for any other non-zero a? How do you think this would look? I have no idea anymore. <laughs> well, let's just start by unpacking what we want to show. So this is what we want to prove. F is continuous at A. So what do these words mean? What do we want to show? So what does F is continuous at A mean? We want to show that the limit of F of, F of X as X approaches A equals F of A. Good. 
Okay, and what do these symbols mean? Oops. By the definition of limit, there ex for I'm trying to remember the right vocabulary. Where every epsilon greater than zero zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that the absolute value of x minus a, in this case as it is beautifully, implies that zero is less than the absolute value of f of x minus f of a is less than epsilon. Good, so this is what we want to prove since we're showing continuity. And we have the nice property that f distributes over addition. Right. So we're trying to show this thing is true, but here we can simplify this using the assumption that f distributes over addition to write this, the guts of this absolute value as f of x minus a, right? So do you agree that if f has this property, then the right side in the definition of the limit simplifies accordingly? Yes. Good, okay. So in fact, this is basically the only step because now we only need to use the assumption that f is continuous at zero. Because the statement that f is continuous at zero means that, oh, I should use a different color, limit as x goes to zero, f of x equals f of zero. This is, we assume this is known which means, uh, similarly, for every epsilon greater than zero, there's a delta greater than zero, so that whenever the absolute value of x is bounded by delta, I should use it. these dummy variables of using x over and over. I'll use this z. So this is what we've assumed is true. f of z minus f of zero, for instance. Well, we don't need to write f of z minus f of zero because of this assumption, because f of z minus f of zero is f of z minus zero, which is just f of z. So this is what we've assumed, because it's continuous at zero. Okay. So now we see the proof reduces, because this nice property that f distributes over addition means that the proof for continuity at any point a allows us to move a inside the argument of f. So we move a into the f of x minus a. But this means that all we need is continuity at the point zero. Because continuity at zero tells us that for any z, we can find, oh, sorry, delta. For any z with the absolute value of z less than delta, we can bound f of z by epsilon. So this is continuity at zero, and we can apply continuity at zero, just kind of pattern matching. You, you change variables so that z is x minus a, and then continuity at zero implies continuity at this point x minus a. OK, I said that a bit sloppily. Uh, I'll, it's written out on the next slide. but. Uh, maybe ask questions about this before I switch. I'm understanding this one better than the previous one. Okay, good. Let's look at the cleaner argument. All right. So we want to show the limit exists at every point A. To do that, we always say you hand me an epsilon. And we're going to start by using, as I say, the assumption that it's continuous at zero. If f is continuous at zero, we can always choose delta, so that whenever absolute value of x is less than delta, then absolute value of f of x minus f of zero is less than epsilon. By the assumption about f of x plus y is f of x plus f of y, this, of course, is the same as f of x. And then using that same value of delta, if absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, then f of x minus f of a, combining using the assumption about the properties of f, 
that's the same as the absolute value of f of x minus a, all inside parentheses. So this thing is upper bounded by epsilon using the assumption that f is continuous at zero. So it's, it, it looks almost uh, too good to be true when you, when you look at it because all that we're doing is uh, combining f of x minus f of a into a single term f of the quantity x minus a using linearity and then saying well we can uh, just kind of pattern match onto its behavior at zero by using that change of variables for instance z. Okay so you say you understand this better than the previous ones. Are there other questions on this stuff? I do not have any questions. Okay. Is the lack of questions because it's totally clear or just because it's uh, sufficiently confusing that it's hard to formulate a question? Not totally clear, but it's clear enough that I can understand it. Okay. Good, good. Uh, probably have to go soon, but I will post the rest of these if we don't get through all of them. So, uh, how about this thing? So just a reminder of one of the things we proved last time. Remember when we had f on that square for oh, 0, what am I doing? From 0, 1 to 0, 1. So we proved that if f is a function on the square, that there's a fixed point, which means there's a point where f of x equals x. That's the same as saying that there's a point where f crosses this diagonal, right? There's the, uh, I'm very bad at drawing straight lines. So last time we proved that there's a point where any function on the square crosses this diagonal. In this problem, there's something slightly different. We're going to prove that every function crosses a diagonal going the other way. So every function defined on the square has a point where f of c equals minus c. And this is very similar to the first splits question where we're going to use some uh, you know, intermediate value theorem type argument. So I will scaffold the proof for you. The first thing, just as we did last time with the uh, kind of upward sloping diagonal case. We split it into two cases. So case one, if for instance f of 0 equals 1 or f of 1 equals 0, we're done. Because if either of these equations are satisfied, then we obviously have a point C where this equation is true because, uh, ah, there's a typo here. Yeah, this should be minus c plus 1. Damn it. Okay. f of c equals minus c plus 1 for some number c. Yeah, if f of 0 equals 1 or f of 1 equals 0, then the equation f of c is minus c plus 1 is manifestly true because plugging in 0 would give me minus 0 plus 1 is 1, and plugging in 1 would give me minus 1 plus 1 is 0. So that's case one. Case two is the one where we'll need to use the intermediate value theorem. So I'll ask you, what strategy should we use in case two to prove the existence of such a number C? Could you perhaps reiterate the question? Sure. Uh, so the question is in case two, which means we're assuming, so I'll just make it a little more explicit. So assume f of zero is less than one and f of one is greater than zero. My question to you is in this case two, how can we prove, how can we prove that there is some number c in 
inside this interval, uh, this should really be the open interval, with f of c equal to minus c plus 1. So this is the question. How can we prove that there exists a number c between 0 and 1 with this property? It seems like in this case, we would be referring to the, um, forget the proper name, either maximum, possibly the maximum value, or I don't know its name. What's the conclusion of the theorem you're trying to name? Like, what does the theorem tell you? I don't even remember. <laughs> well, there's three. There's the, let's see, there's the intermediate value theorem, there was the boundedness theorem, and there's the extreme value theorem. So yeah, extreme. Extreme value. Yeah. So the extreme value theorem tells you that a function achieves its maximum on a closed interval. I was thinking that just because we are. Did you have to go somewhere? What? Oh, you just cut out randomly, sorry. I. I heard uh, a sentence trail off, so I thought you had to leave or something. What were you, what were you saying? I don't even remember. I think I didn't finish the sentence. <laughs> so you literally just trailed off mid-sentence and forgot what you were saying. Sure. Uh, I thought you got interrupted by someone, so I was just being quiet because I was waiting for, uh, for you to come back, but... Um... Okay, well, you were saying you wanted to apply the extreme value theorem, which tells you the function reaches its maximum on a closed interval. Uh, here, since we're trying to prove equality between two expressions, I think it's more useful to use the intermediate value theorem. So this is similar to the first Blitz question, where to prove that, say, sine x equals x minus 1, I think it was, or minus x plus 1, something like that, to prove that that equation had a solution on some interval, we defined a new function and tried to show that that function changed sine. So we can do that here. If we define some function g of x, which might be like f of x uh, plus x minus 1, right? This is the thing which would be 0 if the equation we're interested in were satisfied. So what values does g take at the endpoints, g of 0 and g of 1? I don't believe I totally understand the question. Well, let's see. So what happens if I plug in 0 into g? I get f of 0 plus 0 minus 1. So what is the sign, positive or negative, of the expression f of 0 minus 1? I believe it is positive. Let's see. f of 0 is less than 1. So I think f of 0 minus 1 should be negative, right? Oh, I thought you were just asking about just f of 0. I don't even know. Ah, good. Yeah, sorry. f of 0 minus 1. 
So f of 0 minus 1 is negative, and then when I plug in g of 1, I have f of 1 plus 1 minus 1. So this is positive. Okay. Can you see where the rest of the argument will go now that we've shown that g changes sign? I don't totally remember where we went last time with this. That's a dog. <laughs> Man, you have a lot of dogs running around. Uh, okay, yeah, usually the, the way this argument goes is that you cook up a function g that you want to show hits 0 somewhere, and then you pick two values where g is negative in one place and positive on the other place. And the whole thing relies on the assumption that f is continuous and therefore this g that we've cooked up as a sum of continuous functions is also continuous. So we'd like to argue that since g is continuous and we've picked two points, one where it's negative and one where it's positive, that there has to be an intermediate value where g equals zero, right? That's the goal. Okay, I think we're stuck in the weeds a bit. I'll, I'll just show the, the clean argument, okay. That's what we're trying to show. So. Um, f is continuous on the square, 0, 1 to 0, 1. We're trying to prove that there's a point where f of c equals minus c plus 1. So as I showed in the previous slide, we split it into two cases. In the first case, it's easy. If f of 0 equals 1, then this equation is true and we're done. If f of 1 equals 0, then this equation is true at 1, so we're done. So assume that both of those are not true, which means f of 0 is less than 1 and f of 1 is greater than 0. We define a new function g, which would be 0 at the, at the place where our desired equation is true. So we define g. g is continuous on this closed interval because f is and so are polynomials and constants. And then we just compute g at two values. At 0, g is negative and at 1, g is positive. So by the intermediate value theorem, since g goes from negative to positive, somewhere in between there is a point where g equals 0. And that proves that there's a point where f of c is minus c plus 1. Thoughts on this, or did this make it clearer to see the argument written? I think I understand this. Okay, do you remember how it was different the first, because the last time we did this, it was instead showing there was an f of, I don't know, a, where f of a equals a, right? So the only thing we've changed is before we showed there was a fixed point where f of a equals a, now we've just showed a slightly different result that there's, I don't know what, what to call this, an anti-fixed point or something. There's a different point C where f of C is minus C plus 1. So it was the same argument. All that we did was change the value, of, or sorry, the expression for this helper function g in between. So it's, it's the same argument both times. Is this ringing a bell, the, the thing we did last time with uh, g of x equals f of x minus, minus x. Does that ring any bells? Yes. Good. Okay. Uh, I think the last two might be skippable, or maybe we could do those in a, another time, because this one, this one's kind of fun. And this one appears on consolidation document two. This is stars over Babylon.